Hi, let's eat. That is my <laughs> motto. Pretty much gets me through every day. And food is the most fundamental human need that we all have. And it's, it's definitely, come, we, we come by it pretty uh, honestly because our first connection with our mothers is through food. And then all our lives we gather around the dinner table and share and exchange. So I hope you all got my world peace cookies. Those are a very delicious recipe. That's why they're called world peace cookies. And I gave you the recipe so you can share it with your friends and family too. And I just want you to sort of notice how that makes you feel because now we're connected in a small, special way because we're, we've shared something. Now, whether it's plain or fancy, mother's milk or cookies, all food really has, has the ability to be a catalyst to bring us together. And what I love about food is how it does bring that connection to every day. Now, I'm the youngest of three girls. And when I was in sixth grade, food was what saved me. It became my outlet, my medium. My family was falling apart and I turned to food and that's what got me through. Actually, I think it's why I passed the sixth grade. <laughs> you see, I had started out on the honor roll and then throughout the year, while things were tough at home, I just stopped working and doing my schoolwork. And it was definitely, I wasn't finishing assignments, I'd start them, but it was definitely a tough year for me. And it, to make it worse, on the last day when I was supposed to hand in my report the next day, I stayed up all night and baked a chocolate cake to take to class. <laughs> now, my teacher, thankfully, I think, knew what I was going through, and she let that cake stand in for my final project, and I did pass, and I got to go to middle school. I started my career, actually, in a donut shop, and then I, soon after, went into a pizza place, and then halfway through high school, I was invited to a dinner party with my sister, and the chef that cooked, he was a professional chef, his name was Greg, and I was so amazed at how quickly he cooked and with such exuberance that right there that night I decided I am not going to go to college. I'm going to go to chef school on the south side of Chicago just like Greg. And when I fit in, and, and actually I was amazed that there was a real profession that you could touch food all day and feed people. It was sort of like a dream come true and in those days you know, the chefs were tradesmen. They were like an auto mechanic or a plumber. They were not celebrities and entrepreneurs like they are now. And they definitely weren't women either. So it was kind of an odd choice, but it felt absolutely perfect for me from the very first day. After I graduated from chef school, which is two years, I had my heart set on working at Le Perroquet, which is one of the most wonderful restaurants in Chicago at the time. Now the old world Yugoslav owner, Jovan, granted me an interview and at the end of it he just kind of chuckled and said, you know, I couldn't have you work in the kitchen because you would cause havoc in there with all the boys. But you know, if you need a job, you could be a coat check girl. <laughs> well, <laughs> that didn't go over very well. <laughs> I was immediately incensed and furious and frustrated and I went home and I started a campaign, a barrage of letters and phone calls and after about a month Jovan caved in and said okay you can come come work for me tomorrow, 325 an hour you can peel shallots just don't sue me. <laughs> now a couple months later another young woman knocked on the kitchen door and she was hired on the spot and I kind of got to thinking, well, I guess he noticed that I work circles around the boys and I'm half the price. And that other girl who came into the kitchen was Susan Feniger. We immediately bonded and we became fast friends. We consoled and commiserated and really we got each other through that year. And it was a hard year. It was actually, you know, one of the most intense kitchens we've ever, either of us have ever worked in. And there was a lot to learn, but Doing it together was incredible. And at the end of the year, 
when the chef went on vacation, it wasn't any of those slacker boys who were asked to lead the kitchen and be in charge. It was me and Susan. After Le Perroquet, we both uh, went to France and had apprenticeships. And then we decided we were ready to open our own restaurant. I was 23, and I actually had absolutely no idea about business. We were really lucky because we opened a little cafe called City Cafe, tiny really, and it was an immediate success. Well, about four years in, we raised some money and moved to larger quarters, which was also challenging, but also very successful. And right after we opened, uh, we were honored with a James Beard Award where we had to fly to New York and go to the award ceremony. And it was very exciting, although the, the ceremony was a little bit tedious. So all the interesting people were out in the foyer, actually, at the bar. And uh, we met a gentleman there, a multi restaurant operator from Chicago, who was very, very successful. He was also getting an award. And we really had a lovely chat with him. But little did I know that this random guy was going to become really instrumental in our success a decade later when we were facing bankruptcy. We wrote a couple cookbooks. We opened another restaurant called Border Grill. And we cooked our hearts out for 14 years. And then disaster struck. It was a series of things. Um, there was the LA riots, the earthquake, Malibu fires. There was a pretty serious recession. And sales just sort of plummeted. And there we were without really any knowledge of what to do. And we were paralyzed, just kind of frozen. We were just like dumbstruck. And then we remembered this guy that we'd met at the bar, our buddy from Chicago, and we decided to take a chance and call him up and see if maybe he'd been through something similar at some point. And he was so gracious and wonderful and he sent his top two finance people to come to Los Angeles and spend three days with us. And those guys were amazing. They put, it, they put us through sort of a little mini boot camp, <laughs> a business boot camp. We went through all the P&Ls and we really were learning and understanding a lot from these guys. And they were smart. We really liked them. We trusted them. And at the end, they recommended that we close City Restaurant. This was our beloved first restaurant. It was sort of what put us on the map. And it was absolutely heartbreaking. We, it was like someone asked me to amputate my legs. <laughs> I mean, it was my whole identity. It was everything, I thought. And I was sure that I was going to disappear, and no one would call me or want to eat my food anymore. And it, I was just pretty much at, devastated. So much so that um, when we had our staff meeting to tell everyone that we were going to be closing after we quietly sold the restaurant, I, we, I, Susan and I decided how to t talk to the staff. And you know, I'm a person who almost never cries. But the moment that the staff meeting started, I just started sobbing. <laughs> it's like my entire life of crying happened in that one hour. <laughs> and, you know, we were lucky because, well, I, I actually wanted to stop being a chef. I considered other careers. I wanted to do something that wasn't so hard and difficult. And then I remembered, you know, I just have this relationship with my craft that I didn't think I could abandon. It was something that got me through so many years and brought me so much joy. And you know, we end eventually we had the staff meeting where we had to tell everyone that we were closing, and I did all the crying. And we also had decided to just make the best of a bad moment. And we had a big parking lot sale where we sold uh, to all of our fans and customers. They could buy dishes and ashtrays from City. And we had a band and served champagne and passed appetizers. So it was pretty much uh, bittersweet. But what happened, actually, was life didn't end. I didn't disappear. I didn't have to change careers. And I actually started to have some time to really 
ha let the creative juices flow. And one of the first things I crazy ideas I had was to uh, pitch the local NPR radio station on a radio show about the state of your food. Because I was a young mom and I was learning about things like a poisonous spray on apples that kids were eating and, it, and I was really incensed. So we invited the president of the local radio station over to have lunch with us, of course, and we pitched her on this idea, this radio show. Well, she immediately uh, said, that's a terrible idea, and she was right. But she also offered us our own radio show, a one hour show called Good Food on KCRW, and it could start this weekend, she said. And that radio show actually, which was parodied by Saturday Night Live ruthlessly, <laughs> <laughs> that radio show led to a TV show on the Food Network called Cooking with Two Hot Tamales, and a product line with Whole Foods Market, and another cookbook, and it even we even got a job as the stylists for all the food on a film called Tortilla Soup. So you see, one door closed and a bunch more doors just flew open and it was an amazing time. And now 40 years later, Susan and I are still running our restaurants and still partnering. And it's been a real roller coaster. You know, closing City Restaurant was not the biggest or worst <laughs> failure we've been through. There's been tons and tons of up and downs. But what gets me out of bed every morning is food and how it brilliantly and naturally connects us to each other. So having success doesn't really mean that confronting the failures and the risks are any easier. You'd think it would, but it doesn't. For me, I still am a deer in headlights when I'm faced with those kind of challenges that are scary and risky. And I get that, that feeling in the pit of my stomach. And that's when I know it's a risk that I'll be happy to have taken down the road when my courage kicks in. You know, my courage, I've found, is what makes my life expand exponentially. And not that I don't avoid failure at all costs because, you know, failure is what makes my heart race and <laughs> makes me sweaty and makes me, you know, keeps me honest and humble. And it reminds me that, you know, perfect is not a real thing. So I feel so lucky to be part of the food community and have the ability to connect with people around food. You know, the language of food is universal. And I've had the opportunity to share my passion and my love of food all over the world. We did TV shows in Mexico. I went to Ethiopia on a hunger fighting mission. And I was in Japan with the governor helping to <laughs> promote California produce. And most recently, I was in Pakistan with the State Department on a culinary diplomacy trip where I was really reminded of the power of food because I had many different exchanges, teaching cooking classes and entrepreneurial workshops for young women, talking about nutrition. And it was just the most uh, satisfying way to realize the power of food, which you know I fell in love with way back in sixth grade. I, I really remain hopeful that because food is going to be a hot topic. You know, what happened in the food world was it became the darling of pop culture. And when that happened, I was able to connect with millions of people rather than one diner at a time. And the world is grappling with some pretty big problems from climate change to population to you know, equitable health care. And food's going to play a really important part in solving that. And I'm hopeful because it is such a strong connector for us, such a primal thing. It's at the core of everything. So will we be able to get achieve world peace through cookies or through coming together around food? I don't know. In my view, that's the only way it would be possible. So thank you so much. Enjoy your cookies. <laughs>